because Light and Full, you did so well. It was like, well, Still Searching has to be like, it has to be better. It has to be bigger and, and this. It has to be this expectation that we have now set with this now has to always be duplicated, which is a lot of pressure. I mean, I think Still Searching lives up to the hype in a different direction, but also just as like important and worked. But with after Let Fold You came, yeah, the loss of freedom for me. Like really, I mean, I think, and I don't know if I've ever gotten that back. At times, at times, there's moments, there's record cycles of that freedom of not needing to like live up to an expectation. But generally, I mean, it's sort of, once you've had success as an artist, like it's really impossible to defy the level of expectation or to recreate it or to do any of the things that you have to do now that you've like had the success. Hey, what's up? I'm Buddy from Census Fail, and this is the oral history of Census Fail. Before Census Fail, I was, uh, well, I was just a kid in high school. The exact date of what is Census Fail starts in February 2002, but we were actually together before then. Uh, actually, pre-9-11, like little, like August 2001, technically. I was a senior in high school. I was 17. Yeah, 17. So... Um, that's when we I met Garrett, and I was just like a kid in a band. I was really into punk music. I was really into hardcore. I, I kind of like was just learning about Thursday and Saves a Day, and just sort of getting into that. I'd been in kind of mainly punk bands like Fat Records, No Facts, Propagandi, Bad Religion, sort of the more traditional punk stuff. I was just a, just a kid trying to figure out. Uh, what I was going to do with the next phase of my life. The band that I had before was called Anti-Clerical, which pretty much just means bad religion. Just another way of saying bad religion. They were a year older than me, and they graduated, and they were moving on to college and those things. And we, we kind of weren't really doing anything, and I started looking around for other people to play with on a message board um, called the NJScene.com. Or it was called Ska and J Ska at the time, technically Ska and J Ska. And that's where I found Garrett through a message board. He was posting like, looking for a guitar player who likes Saves the Day, Fairweather, The Get Up Kids, uh, Thursday. And I just recently got into. I'd like The Get Up Kids for a while, um, and sort of like Midwestern emo type stuff. And so I was like, oh, this sounds like someone who's trying to maybe start something interesting and I reached out to him and went over and played uh, guitar with because I was a guitar player at the time I didn't sing he knew a drummer from a band that he was in and we had a guy and then we found a bass player and we it was just the four of us and um, I just we didn't have a singer and I was like well I guess I can sing you know I'll sing and play guitar and we, we wrote a couple songs one of them ended up staying called Dreaming in Reality which is technically our very first song and then we played our first show at my high school and uh, that was the first census fail show I think it was in like 2001 was our was our first show at my high school so that's like the very very early history that we don't normally talk about just because the band technically starts when we meet Dan and Dave. Dave knew Dan through a friend. Dave knew Garrett loosely through some mutual people, but also like he was in this band called October Skies. We all lived in these towns next to each other in New Jersey. So we, we didn't know each other because we were all in, in high school. So we just, you know, knew, the, you know, I'm talking like you're 10 minutes away, but it might as well be a different world because you don't. Yeah, I don't know each other. The second weekend in February is our first like official practice. Garrett and I had played the one show. 9-11 happened. Um, a friend of mine died, which I write a song about later called Steven. And I, I, we just, I don't know. It was just a kind of a weird time. I was a senior, Garrett was a junior. And not really sure why, but we just disbanded. Our bass player decided to leave. Uh, didn't want to drive. He was driving from pretty far away. He didn't really want to do it anymore. And our drummer 
wasn't really that good and we didn't really like him and uh we just couldn't find anyone we just it just didn't feel right first part of your senior year you're kind of like applying to colleges and trying to figure out what you're going to do with the next phase of your life and i don't know i just it, it didn't feel 100 percent. but then we got together in february with dan and with Dave, and we started playing, and then it just felt right. It was like something clicked. It was like magic. It was like, whoa, okay. Garrett Garrett hit me back up, I think, like early 2002, or maybe at the beginning of the year, and was like, hey, man, like I got this drummer, and he's amazing. You know, Let's try to like do this again. And I was like, okay, cool. And then we decided to get a guitar player because we're like, you should, you know, Garrett's like, you should sing, like, because that was what I was doing. And... I was like, okay, you know, let, like, let's do it. Dan was like 15, or he might even have been, he might even have been 14. I mean, he was a freshman in high school. I'm, I'm almost 100% positive he was a freshman in high school. Probably the best drum I've ever played with. I mean, so, and you could see that at that age. And that was really, I think, the spark that was like, whoa, okay, cool. Garrett and I have, like, some cool ideas, and now this kid can really, like, make this real and then Dave came in and he had some cool ideas as well put together a three song demo which I'm pretty sure consisted of Dream and a Reality it consisted of Free Fall Out of Parachute and Steven so we went we did three songs we were super stoked and uh, we started playing shows after that immediately our first show I think might have been in April it was with a band called Runaway Orange and a band called Tokyo Rose which the bass player of Tokyo Rose Mike Glitter becomes the um, bass player of Senses Fail. The band name originates from, I had a really inspirational teacher in high school. His name was Mr. May. He was paraplegic. He was a history teacher, but he really, really was interested in like philosophy. So he started teaching this class called East Eastern, well, one was Eastern philosophy and one was Western philosophy. And I took both of them, I was super into them. And I really, really liked mythology as well. I discovered Joseph Campbell at that time. And I had also been into different ideas about religion and, and theology and trying to make sense of the world. And uh, with the backdrop of 9-11, I reflected on this idea in Buddhism um, that our senses don't always tell us the true story. Uh, they don't always portray reality. Just because we see it and we hear it and we feel it doesn't necessarily mean it's the truth. We interpret our sensations based upon our own conditioning. We filter the sense, our senses through that filter. So. It's this idea that our senses fail to give us the true um, nature of reality. That resonated with me a lot. But I didn't feel fully real or fully truthful in who I was. I felt as if I should have been, and, and I, I should have been technically a lot happier, um, well-adjusted given my upbringing and, and, and how things were, but I, I had some pretty early traumatic experiences that kind of set me up to, to view the world through a different lens. And uh, so the name Senses Fail comes from that idea, kind of encapsulated where I was at the time that I kind of like really didn't feel comfortable in who I was or where I was or what I was doing or what I was going to do or even the world in general. And that Senses Fail, um, it, just, it just felt to me as an embodiment of, if I had to like explain how I felt, that would be a good term. <laughs> the time when I realized what Census Fail's sound was, was, was Dreaming of Reality, when Garrett played just the chords to that. It was the first song we ever, we ever wrote, we ever worked on, Garrett wrote it, and it's like, this is what I want Census Fail to be, which is like dark, and it kind of sounded like Saves the Day, but it, it didn't, it kind of sounded like Thursday, but it was a little poppier, but it was definitely darker, but it wasn't punk, but it was like this dark, sad, poppy thing, but wasn't Alkaline Trio. Like, it, where Alkaline Trio was punk, Census Fail is not punk. Census Fail is em an emo band. It, and it was in Drop D, because the funny thing is Garrett tried out for Armor for Sleep, and I just he didn't end up in the band, but he learned how to tune his guitar and drop D, which drop D really became a sound for those New Jersey bands. If you say that would be the 
original census fail sound and then we built everything off that and of course we've gone and done all sorts of crazy things and then come back and whatnot but i would say dream and reality like dream and reality steven ground folds those those first three songs that we did it was pretty immediate like okay cool this is our sound as far as let it unfold you i still like don't know the impact that it had we definitely didn't know at the time i mean we were just you know touring in a van put out a record like we had no idea you know i mean we had some semblance when like a lot of the shows started selling out and like just doing bigger than what they had been but even still like there's no social media like there's no we weren't getting radio play we were getting fuse we were like not on mtv yet so there was some stuff but then again like i really wasn't paying attention to stuff like that like at that time in my life i was really just like enjoying the innocence of just sort of like performing music and like traveling around the country there was no expectation like and that's the most beautiful time in a band's in any in any artist's existence is the lack of expectations after that tour uh, everything changed yeah so i think we had a sense of like the success but i i, I don't know i don't even know if i really fully understand the impact it had it seems to be a record from that time that sticks out we are definitely not a band's band. I think we've become a band's band by being around for as long as we are. So then you have, you end up influencing people that like go on to be super successful and do all sorts of things. But we were definitely in Let It Fold Your Time. We were not a band's band. We were, you know, considered sort of cheesy and not necessarily real musicians and that. You know, we were super young. So there was a little bit of that, like, oh, these guys are, you know, they're so young, they didn't put in their dues, all that stuff. So we weren't really, we were not, you know, we weren't hearing, like, critical acclaim from anyone. Like, if you go back and search the internet at the time for, like, Let It Unfold You reviews, most of them are generally, like, this is pretty watered-down garbage. So it's really funny to fast-forward to now, and it's sort of, like, considered this record that, I don't want to say on a pedestal, but it's definitely a record that for that time was one of, is is considered one of the records that if you want to listen to early 2000s emo, you know, you go listen to Three Cheers, Let It Unfold You, Tell All Your Friends, you know, maybe you do, under, you know, you know, Full Collapse. And that would be the like immediate, like, here are the eight records you should check out. Ours is one of them. So, at least I think, I don't know. Let It Fold You coming out was an insane process because it had been done a year before. We were on drive through we got uplifted to Geffen, which means that they had a contractual agreement that Geffen could take their bands, which they took Newfound and Mid, uh, Midtown and, and Starting Line and Finch, and we were plucked up. So we were in the process. We, we had started our recording process under drive through um, paid for by drive through did most of the record before we ever went on the drive through tour, then in between when we finished the record and the drive through tour, we were we were uplifted to Geffen. Got different management, we, we, we changed some things. We wanted to release the record because we felt we have all this hype, like we gotta get this record out. Like we believe in this record, it's a big record, we're ready. Geffen's like, okay, well we don't hear any singles, so we wanna like have some more singles. So we're like, okay, you know what? We have some time, we write, write a couple more songs, we wrote Buried a Lie. We wrote Rummage for Jinking, which ended up being two of our biggest songs. We ended up leaving Geffen for Vagrant and then the record coming out. Let It Fold You comes out and things change. Immediately during the Let It Fold You tour, my grandma died, which sent me sort of like down a really dark path. Success at that time was like a constant upward motion. As long as we all collectively felt like we were going like this, Everything was cool. The moment there was like a little is is when people panicked. All of our friendships changed along with that sort of loss of freedom. You know, it went from being just this group of people that like came together to make these songs that meant something to people to like, oh, like 
why isn't this successful? Like, is it this person's fault? Is it that person's fault? Is it the manager's fault? You know, and you start having all these discussions. There was so much time spent looking at other bands going, well, why aren't we as big as them? And why aren't we as big as them? And what did we do wrong? I didn't enjoy another record until our last one. Almost 12 years of the band's existence that, give or take, really didn't feel like rewarding. <laughs> Success then was dictated outwardly, you know, and I think over the last two or three years, I've been able to make success more of an inward thing. Now, I want to be able to do this for the rest of my life, so there has to be some level of actual success. Like, there has to, like, people have to like it, they have to decide they want to spend their money on it in order for me to, like, call it success and be able to view it as a success. Because I've also written records that people don't show up for because they don't like it, because it's not what they want, and they did, didn't want Census Fail to sound like Converge or whatever. So now success is sort of almost is like a is like a split. Like I have to be happy with what I'm doing, and our fans need to be happy, and then I'm I'm just trying to maintain. I just want to maintain what we have. Like I don't need to constantly be going like this. Because in reality, like, I don't even know if that's possible. The band's almost broken up all the time. I mean, the band almost broke up on Still Searching. Uh, I was going to get kicked out of the band. Uh, we had a member leave. Uh, Life is not a waiting room. Sort of saw, when we saw Heath leave, which definitely changed people's overall thing. Um, the record after that, we had another person leave. Me, personally, I didn't get pretty much totally disenfranchised until after the fire and that's when I started exploring other options. Uh, the two records that don't sound like Census Fail that sound more like heavy. Uh, I was working at Vagrant, I was managing bands, I kind of was trying to exit the band. I needed to try to like find something else to do. I wanted to do something else. I didn't want to be beholden to living life that way and uh, I went and tried all these different other things and ultimately realized that I, they weren't for me and that being um, a creative person is what I need to do. The last record stems out of I wanted like we came home from this tour with Silverstein we put out Pull the Thorns from Your Heart and I was like completely just like I don't want to do this anymore I don't want to play shows I don't know what to do with my life so I went back to school and I got a job working at a donut shop and then found out I was having a kid it was like I have to make this band work like I have to make this band work so uh, and then my wife had a miscarriage so that really changed things for me I was like well now I need to do this like and I've I've like put my I've taken all my eggs out of it went somewhere else and came back to it like this really has to work. So much of my identity, too, that it's kind of hard to, like, be someone else other than Buddy from Census Fail. Like, I'm not really sure there's much of a difference between Buddy Nielsen and Buddy from Census Fail. I'm pretty sure they're the same person. There's definitely differences that I'm trying to make now to separate who I am from who I am in the band because at times it's been way too close and that's something that I've realized that I don't have to be that person all the time. The last record is the first one I wrote. I never wrote for Census Fail musically. Garrett wrote all of it up until the fire and then we sort of wrote it collectively with a friend of mine who was in a side project I had called Bayonet. So that it's been like a whole new creative process for me that that is exciting and feels like fulfilling. I don't like all the records we have because I wasn't the one dictating the sonics of it. You know, I was the one doing the lyrics and the melodies and you know, even then like we're we're trying to agree upon an idea between five people is a lot different when it's just one person's vision. Um, which now it's just really just where do I want to take the band? And then the expectation. There was no expectation for this record. Nobody was like, oh yeah, Census Fail is going to put out a record and everyone's going to love it. And they're, you know, nobody was really like looking for this Census Fail record. Now we put this out and now there's a lot of expectations. So uh, it's just the, the way that it works. Like, you know, you put out something that people like and then you have this expectation. So now it's this next record to me is like, has a lot of weight to it. But I just, the pressure isn't there like that there was. 
I want to talk about what it what, what it really means to age and be honest with like the reality that I'm not a 22 year old like that I'm a 35 year old that has children and um, like looks at my life as not a finite thing you know and like living with the realities of what is you know real that our time with our loved ones isn't finite and then how do we respond to the truth of that and like how do we live a meaningful life while um, and how do we heal I think that's a really important aspect of it is like healing it's like how do we heal for our children how do we heal for ourselves so that when we age we have wisdom rather than are desperately trying to either keep up with youth or desperately just trying to deny reality but we have the wisdom to give to like other people so that's what i want sets fail music to be I, I want the legacy of the band to be the change that i've undergone um, i want the legacy of the band to be the ability to heal have the freedom and the um poise to be able to accept the things that happen to us and to meet them and respond in a way that doesn't cause more harm. Want also people to look at the band as being a real band that really wasn't concerned with appealing to everybody. I mean, there's aspects of us that obviously do, but we made a lot of decisions that were not smart solely because we wanted to have, like, have our own integrity. Could have probably been bigger had we played the game, but we just always wanted to have the freedom to be creative and to not play anyone else's sort of game. And um, we, we've always remained uh, an independent artist because of that.